It's August 20th, 2020. This is Rook. Diversity in the Diaspora. Today, two Iranian Americans of very different demographics, each playing an important role in bringing focus to diversity in varying forms in the global Iranian community. First, the author responsible for bringing the story of the Iranian Schindler to an international audience, Fadi Bors Mohdari, on Saad Dari and a legacy of Jewish Iranian relations. And then a young woman playing a pioneering role in addressing the lack of diversity in Silicon Valley, Sepide Nasidi on the plight of Iranian women and women of color in tech. All that plus the studio team are in place with some prickly letters of the week. I'm Gian Gomeshi. This is Rook. Go. Welcome to episode number 37 of Rook. Hope you are well. Oh. <laughs> Good evening. <laughs> Good evening. <laughs> Trying to phrases every day. <laughs> <laughs> it just, I just want to say, <laughs> say something once without having to hear something from the Shia peanut gallery. Uh, we... <laughs> Just stick to English, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> what was wrong with that? There's nothing, nothing wrong with that. You, you emphasize on Khushal Bashin, so I was excited. Yeah, well, as you should be. <laughs> we have a big Thursday show today. Sepide Nasiri is going to join us in about an hour. She is... Uh, She's doing really important work in shedding light on the lack of diversity in Silicon Valley and the, the tech industry. Specifically, she has founded an organization to support the role of Iranian women and women of color in, in the tech business. She's coming up, and in just a few moments, Fadi Bors Mohtari with the inspiring and uh, sad tale of Abdul Hussein Saadari, uh, or the Iranian Schindler, as the moniker that has been applied to him goes. Uh, he's coming up in just a few moments. The the Rook studio team is here, as you can hear. Captain Reza, hello. Hello, sir. The fabulous Keon. Hello, Jean. TFK. What? Oh. The fabulous Keon. Oh, <laughs> pardon me. What did you call me? <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm trying to think of ways to make it faster. The, the fabulous Keon and Groovy Shia. Hello, hello. Hello. Hi. I didn't even say Khoshal Hastin, by the way. No. Uh, uh, by the way, Keon, uh, yes. you've warned me as you were coming in that you have some feisty letters of the, uh, uh, in our Letters yeah. of the Week segment. Brace coming up. yourself. There's some opposing <laughs> opinions. Let's just put it that way. We've, uh, we're getting used to that now. That's okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and it's good to hear from both sides. So, all right, yeah. all right. Or from one of the sides, <laughs> some of the sides. <laughs> Um, next week, we are looking at the Pahlavi dynasty on the occasion of the uh, 40th anniversary this summer of the passing of the last Shah of Iran. So, Dr. Abbas Milani will be joining me on Monday for a feature interview. Also next week, the historians and authors Andrew Scott Cooper and Mohammed Amini. And all three of them disagree with each other <laughs> on elements of the legacy of the Shah, so we will have a diversity of views. Uh, I should also mention before we get to our first guest, our support for this show today comes from a guy named Arash Behzadi. Arash Behzadi. He is a successful entrepreneur and businessman, but he is best known for his beautiful and spiritual work as a piano player and composer. He says his music is not just about entertainment, it is for the soul, it is about awakening the soul, and uh, indeed many people use his music for healing and therapeutic reasons, and he's performed concerts around the world. He's also pioneered something called, I talked about this on our Monday episode, Piano Yoga. And I didn't know, but you, Keon, you were telling me that you've actually done this. I've gone to a few of his piano yoga sessions. So what is, uh, so, so I mean, I described it as he intuitively plays the piano from the energy of the people doing the mm -hmm. yoga. And this is like, can be hundreds of people doing There's it. There's just so much 
energy in that room and you feel the powerful music within you. I, I, it's hard to explain, but it really, you feel the healing power of the music he plays as you're wow. doing yoga. It's beautiful. And, the, and yeah, he says that the, I mean, he's a yogi himself mm -hmm. and he says the music, the piano music takes you to a deeper place. Yeah. It kind of makes you, it takes you on your own self-reflecting journey and you kind of think about your life and it heals you along the way. It's, it's like I said, it's very hard to explain, but it's just, it's, it feels it's really good. It's good to know that you're doing that, reflecting yeah, on your life. I try to every now and I then. I see. Hmm. Everyone should do that once in a while. <laughs> uh, Arash can be found at Arash Piano on Instagram, Arash Piano. Thank you to Arash Besadi for your support for arts and culture in the Iranian diaspora and for your support of Rook. Okay, Keon, you'll be back with the letters of the week yes. in a little bit. Uh, Captain Reza, Groovy Shaya. We'll also get to Sepi de Nasiri in a little while. But first... There are important parts of our collective history that have either received little attention or have been ignored outright for some political reason or another, or another. But often those very obscure facts are the most important parts and exactly the parts that could lead to our salvation. My first guest today is solely responsible for bringing one of those rare historic gems to international spotlight. In his factual and dramatic book, In the Lion's Shadow, Fadi Bors Mukhtari recounts the actions of Abdul Hussein Saadari, Iranian consul general in Nazi occupied Paris in 1942, a man who helped thousands of Iranian and non Iranian Jews escape the Holocaust at great risk. According to Professor Mukhtari's research, the late Ambassador Saadari may have saved more lives than Oscar Schindler, but he has received far less recognition in comparison. And indeed, Abdul Hussein Saadari died penniless and alone after the Second World War and the Iranian Revolution in the early 1980s. The author who brought this amazing bit of history to light, Fadi Bors Mukhtari, has had his own impressive career of journalism, professorship, uh, also work with the Near East South Asia Center for Strategic Studies. To discuss the story of Sardari, the reasons behind a universal historic omission of the Sardari tale, and what motivated the author to pursue this fascinating story, I am joined by Professor Fadi Bors Mukhtari from Vermont today. Hello, sir. Well, hello. Uh, how are you? Listen, I'm, I'm very well. I, I, I'll be very honest. I, I very much enjoyed reading this book. I'm glad that uh, I, I'm, I'm ashamed that bringing you on the program was my impetus to, to read it. I should have read it anyway. It's fascinating, and I thank you for it. Well, I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Uh, Professor Mukhtari, where did this extraordinary story start for you? How, how did it come upon your radar that there had been an Iranian responsible for saving Jewish lives during the Holocaust in France. Mm -hmm. And when did you know you wanted to make a book out of it? This really goes back to my own upbringing. I lived uh, in a family, an environment uh, that really uh, showed me uh, the general tolerance that the Iranian culture has. And we lived, uh, for instance, uh, uh, in, in an area where Jewish families were our neighbors. Uh, and I, from childhood, I had Jewish friends, and we would go to their houses, and they would come to our house uh, and play. Uh, so th th this really was the background. And then uh, later on, uh, I had heard rumors that Iranian diplomats and officials had helped uh, uh, not only Jews, but uh, various victims of Nazi uh, oppression and so on. When I uh, read something, I, I think it was a book about Prime Minister, late Prime Minister Hoveido, by uh, uh, Professor Abbas Milani. There was a reference to, to a diplomat who had helped Jews in, in France. Uh, I called his publisher, and through the publisher, I got in touch with him. Uh, uh, and he gave me the na names of a few people who had told him that. So I contacted those people. Uh, and finally, uh, I was meeting a friend of mine from high school. Uh, his name is Nasser, last name Shariati. Uh, we were in New Jersey at his home, and I mentioned that I have this story, but I don't have eyewitnesses. Uh, his wife, God bless her, Shore, said uh, uh, in a very 
friendly man. <laughs> you dummies, uh, you have a classmate from Albors High School whose wife was was in France at the time. <laughs> so we called him, uh, the gentleman's name is Majid Azizi. Uh, we called Majid, Majid came over, he lives in New Jersey too, and he brought his wife. <laughs> and, and through that, uh, we made a few telephone calls to her relatives in Los Angeles and the whole thing started. Uh, the ball started rolling. You know, the story is so fantastic. The story of Sardari, this this man, this uh, who uh, ends up saving these Jewish lives in 1942 in France uh, and, and through the Second World War. It's the kind of thing that I can imagine Iranians say, telling each other over the dinner table, or uh, it's almost like this mythical story that we would tell. Tell me about the. It takes a lot to write a book like this about a subject that hasn't even been um, codified, that hasn't even been uh, uh, realized before historically, uh, that you know that you're going to go and have to do the primary research and, and bring this story to light. Tell me about why that was so important to you. I mean, you say you grew up with Jewish friends in Iran, but, but why go embark on this journey? Well, deep down, uh, I knew that our culture really had this this very basic uh, tolerance in it. Uh, it is embedded in our culture. Uh, so deep down, I, I wanted this story uh, to be true. I, I actually was convinced that it was true. Uh, when I started uh, digging evidence and I went to national archives and met people and talked to people, it, it gave me such a, a feeling of uh, satisfaction that it confirmed my, my belief in tolerance. So it, 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 it was a labor of love, in a, in a manner of speaking, uh, and it took a long time. It, it took several years to do this, <laughs> you know, but it was very satisfying. Why were you so convinced that Iranians uh, have this tolerance? You talk about uh, the neighbors when you were, uh, you were born after the Second World War, but you were born into a military family and you grew up in a mixed neighborhood that included many Iranian Jews. Where did, the, where did the idea come from that, I mean, it's a laudable one, and I would hope this would be the case, but that, that Iranians practice such tolerance? Well, I, some of it I had seen, uh, you know, in my, my own family, in my extended family. I might have mentioned earlier, uh, when I was uh, about two and a half, three years old, we were visiting my, uh, uh, my grandparents my, on my mother's side in Kerman Shah, and uh, one day, my grandfather called his uh, uh, butler, a person who would take care of the household affairs, uh, and uh, told him to, his name was Nazir Khan, so Nazir Khan, go to the neighbor's house and, and uh, uh, turn on the lights and, and uh, start the fire in their kitchen. Uh, and I thought, you know, why does somebody have to go to somebody else's house to turn on the lights? And later on, I found out that this was a Saturday and they were Orthodox Jews, and they were neighbors. Uh, later on, of course, we had our own uh, Jewish neighbors. On top of that, we had relatives who had gone abroad, for instance, and, and married and come back with wives who were Christian or, 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 or of different nationality, or French, uh, German, and, and so on. Uh, and I, I also remember we had a, a family member on my mother's side from, from Kurdistan, but uh, he was married to to a beautiful, stunningly beautiful lady uh, who happened to be Jewish. Uh, there, there were things like this that convinced me that uh, all the things that I had heard about tolerance, and later on, of course, by reading history, this was confirmed. You know, it's so interesting. It's almost been a recurring theme on Rook that... Um despite the outer appearance or generalization that might, might be made about Iran, particularly contemporary Iran, that it's some kind of uh, monolith of uh, people, Islamic automatons <laughs> wandering around uh, somewhere in the Middle East, uh, that uh, it is and certainly was a, a very diverse society. We're hearing this over and over again from people uh, who grew up there before the revolution in very mixed neighborhoods of, of, uh, or um, even even in contemporary uh, parts of Iran now? Well, the, the image you have here uh, at the moment of Iran is, is really a very thin veneer on, on top of that historical culture that we have. It, it, it's, it's, you, you scratch the surface and, and, and you see something completely different. 
Uh, again, in my own family, I, I have an adopted brother uh, who's a uh, who's a Turkmen, and Turkmen are are uh, Sunni. Uh, he's he's my brother. <laughs> we have never had even the slightest issue about you know being Sunni or being Muslim or you know uh, these things just didn't come up mm. you know before the revolution. <laughs> so the theme of this book or the turning point the trick to mm. saving lives mm -hmm. was for abdul hussein sardari to do something quite remarkable and that's to convince the germans that uh jewish people from iran iranian jews were somehow different from non-iranian jews how did he do that and why would the germans fall for it Two basic reasons. Uh, one of them is the uh, absurdity and inconsistency in the uh, German racial policy, their ideology of dividing people by races and by blood and stuff of that sort uh, really doesn't cut the scientific muster. It just right. <laughs> doesn't do it. So Sardari exploited that. Uh, at the same time, Sardari had a command of several languages, you know, French and German, uh, Persian and English. Uh, he had gone to boarding school in England since he was seven years old, and he had a legal education. And therefore, he had this, this skill uh, to pose questions or propose ideas uh, that, uh, that would um, make people stop and think, uh, even if they were not convinced, they hesitated, you know, <laughs> uh, and, he, and he cultivated this. Uh, he, he would pose these questions and write to various officials. Uh, and the Germans really, I would classify the, the Germans into several groups. There were some Germans who were of old families uh, and didn't really like the, the Nazis. Uh, you know, one of them, for instance, was the first secretary at the uh, German embassy in France. Uh, he was a friend of Sadr. He, he would help him out. Then you had some people in, in the official uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs or various other places who were careerists. They, they had joined the Nazi party in 1933 and they wanted advancement. Uh, and, and therefore they towed the line because they wanted to go to higher places, uh, uh, better positions and salaries and so on. And there, there were another group who were uh, true believers in the ideology and followed it blindly. Uh, the division among these people uh, helped Sadori to pose the questions and, and what he would write would go from one group to another group to another group. And in many cases would end up in, in centers for study of race and things of that sort. His argument was quite astounding i mean it's it's almost absurd on the face of it uh, it says that somehow the jews that were coming from iran were aryan and not semites and so they're different and and uh, but again as you say he is exploiting the actual absurdity of of nazi laws or or, or, or notions of of racially dividing people into groups and and discriminating against them uh, in horrific ways um where would the argument come from that that these are Aryans and not Semites? How did he make that case? He went back to history and he said Cyrus the Great freed the Jews from Babylon and, and helped them go back to their homes uh, and if, in fact helped them to build their temples and so on. Therefore the Jews left Iran. But uh, some of the Iranians of Aryan stock who were you know, your cousins, <laughs> Germans, they liked the teachings of Prophet Moses, and uh, they, they followed some of the teachings. Uh, and Sadori turned up in, in French, <laughs> you know, mosaics. These are followers of uh, Moses. Moses. Uh, therefore, he argued that uh, these are not uh, from, from a racial perspective or from blood perspective. They are not Jewish. They are Aryan. They are Persian of Aryan stock. Uh, but they just happened to follow some of the teachings of Moses. In addition to that, in fact, I think you brought this up, uh, there was a political aspect to this too. Yes, which is, I guess you're, you're alluding to the idea that, um, that the Germans, in, in some cases, whether they believed this case that Saradari was making or not, they wanted to keep good relations with the Iranians for the purposes of the Second World War. 
Yes, uh, Iran was crucial to them. Again, the, the best example is, is a, a gentleman called uh, Van der Schulenberg. Schulenberg had been ambassador to Iran, minister to Iran. And therefore, one of the letters went to Schulenberg uh, to inquire whether Sadari's claim was true or not. Now, Schulenberg responded, I, I have the quotation here. Uh, and uh, this is Schulenberg writing. This is translation from German. As I recall, the Yuguten, I refer to uh, either mosaics or Yuguten, which is a play on, on the uh, German Juten for, for, for Jews, Jew. Yeah. Uh, uh, as I recall, the Yuguten constitute a Muslim sect that essentially follows Mohammedan principles. The scope of the theology of Moses that they have adopted is very limited. On the basis of blood, they are Iranian, not Semite. Therefore, applying the German Jewish laws to them seems unjustified. We are trying, despite all the difficulties facing us, to maintain our good relations with Iran. Prejudice against Yuguten will defeat our efforts and will give our enemies propaganda ammunition to use against us. The Political Bureau 13 of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs recommends not applying the laws of German Jews to Yuguten, or at the very least, postponing the implementation. <laughs> this is a direct quote from a letter that yeah. he, he has written. Not so subtle. <laughs> There's clearly a political motive there. You know, the interesting part, I mean, if it's heroic that Sardari is using these arguments, using his charisma, using his speaking skills and his, his facility with languages to make the case to save these Jewish lives of Iranian Jews in France, it's real heroism when he also does this to save other Jews who aren't Iranian, but he makes the case that they are Iranian for the sake of saving them. Can you tell us about that part of the story? Yes. Again, that's a very interesting point. Uh, and there are two sides to that. One is that he had created a network. You see, the Germans were not satisfied with one document. They wanted multiple documents in order to be convinced that something was you know, as claimed. So Sardini had to create a network. Uh, he would issue a document. Well, because of this network that he created, uh, there was a great deal of trust. Uh, and therefore, his Jewish friends would come to him, uh, Jewish Iranian friends, and say, we have non-Iranian partners, business partners, or uh, we have married to uh, non-Iranians. Um, and, and Sadori would, would, would try to help them out. Now, the other side of this issue is that, according to Iranian laws, the cabinet of any government in Iran has the authority, legal authority, to give citizenship to any person who makes a commitment to serve the national interests of Iran. The person would, would say, I wish to donate a hospital or build a hospital or a school or do something of, of that sort in, in a location in Iran. And uh, Sadari would use this as a provision to send a letter to the uh, government in Iran, to the cabinet, to request an application for this guy receiving Iranian citizenship. So he really wasn't above the law. He, he, there, there was a legal provision for doing this. But uh, he did that, and, uh, and he did it with quite a bit of success. Given that he prosecutes, that he presides over these, uh, the saving these lives, mm -hmm. it makes it all the more heartbreaking, this story, uh, when he, after the Second World War, towards the end of it and afterwards, he becomes basically this lonely, isolated man who is neither accepted in Germany nor in Iran, despite what he has done, uh, and over the years becomes relatively uh, unknown, only to die after the Iranian Revolution in exile, lonely and without very much money. It's in some ways as inspiring as the tale of this Iranian Schindler, uh, mm. Abdul Hussein Sardari is. It's quite a sad story, isn't it? It is a very sad story. He had a very unpleasant childhood. 
his father had passed away at a very young age. He was sent to England at the age of seven. Uh, his mother basically neglected him. Sardari was, was basically left uh, with the servants to, to be taken care of, and at the age of seven was sent to, to England. So as a child, he, he really was deprived of that love and affection of the parents. Then later on, when he was in Paris, he fell in love with a young lady from China who was an opera singer. Her parents had sent her to France to study music. He uh, referred to her affectionately as Chin Chin. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when the civil war in China started, Chin Chin went to visit pa her parents and disappeared. Nobody heard from her again. So Sardari lost his you know, love of his life. And then uh, after the war, he was accused of having um, misappropriated uh, some of the funds that Iran had sent to France to purchase arms and ammunition for the army. And of course, he couldn't do that during the war. You know, during the war, you couldn't purchase arms and ammunition and send it to, to Iran. So he was accused of not uh, having uh, done his duty or misappropriating the funds when Iran st uh, stopped sending money to uh, France uh, after Iran declared war on Germany. Uh, and then uh, it was during the uh, government of uh, Prime Minister Mossadegh, uh, the foreign minister uh, had an uh, axe to grind against him. That, that's another story in itself. If you fast forward to the end of the Shah and the, and the Iranian revolution, why does at that point Sardari raise the ire of the, the new regime in Iran? Well, uh, because he, he was the uh, nephew of Prime Minister Hoveida, right, uh, and uh, and of course, <laughs> you know, uh, he was he was accused of uh, all sorts of things um, because of that association. Uh, after the war, he 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 was um, detained for ten uh, ten days or so, and then uh, uh, Ambassador Sepahudi, who had known him and worked with him, uh, worked with him in in both Switzerland and France, went to. Prime Minister Gavam, Ahmad Gavam, uh, Gavam went to the Shah and uh, Shah issued a royal pardon. Uh, so, you know, uh, he was allowed to come out of detention and rehabilitated. Uh, he went to the embassy, Iran, Iranian embassy in Iraq. But after the uh, coup d'etat in, in Iraq, uh, when they overthrew the monarchy, uh, then he returned to Iran and left the foreign ministry and joined the Iranian oil company. An oil company sent him to England. And he was in England until uh, the revolution. So it's fair to say that when Abdul Hussein Sardari was living his final days with little material goods and, and uh, basically alone in England, it's fair to say that he wouldn't have guessed at that point that uh, 20 years later, um, people would be talking about him as a hero, um, as a product of a claimed book. Uh, not at all. No, he, he was a. Uh, not only he was a modest man. He he didn't think he had done anything special. Uh, and actually, there are two very examples to illustrate this. Um, one of them is that uh, I think in, it was in nineteen uh, late sixties or seventies, uh, he received a letter from Yad Vashem in in uh, Israel that uh, we have heard you, you, you helped the, the Jews during the war. And his response, I, I actually saw the, uh, that, that letter, his response, it's, it's a short, very short letter, two lines. It is, well, th thank you very much for, for your kind uh, notice and letter. But I simply performed my duty. It was my duty to look after Iranians, and I did so. Hmm. And, they, and signed. That was it. Uh, so this is one example that shows he, he didn't think he had done anything special. Uh, another example, I have mentioned this in, in my book again. There was a ceremony at, uh, in, in Los Angeles at the uh, uh, Simon Wiesenthal Center. And at that ceremony, Sadari was mentioned and his nephew and uh, late Ambassador Hoveidov, Feridun Hoveidov was there. Uh, Hoveidov said, uh, after the war, he went to France, and he just happened to walk into the apartment of uh, his uncle, Sadori, and he saw a group of people there with a, they are giving him a silver plate inscribed uh, uh, things thanking him. 
And he realized that these are the leaders of the Jewish community in Paris mm. uh, who have come to thank him and you are giving him this silver plate as a sort of uh, gesture of thanks. He said, as soon as these people left, I got excited. I said, uncle, I'm, I'm going to call the uh, newspapers and, and let people know and so on. And he said, uh, in his word, he astonished. <laughs> he, he said, you never do anything of the sort. Oh. <laughs> I said, uncle, why not? He said, because I simply performed my duty. And he said, uncle, I've, some of these were not Iranian. They, they, they were French. And he said, well, and that was my duty to God. <laughs> that was it. Wow. But, you know, even though he was uh, that humble, uh, the story is so important and so astounding. Why is it that unlike Oscar Schindler, uh, not to take anything away from Schindler, of course, uh, but I mean, yeah. that was a, a hit film and book and, and the entire world knows his name. We can use him as a uh, as a reference here. Uh, why is it that Sardari is so little known around the world? Well, part of it is, of course, his, his own modesty. Part of it is that a lot of people simply don't know. And part of it is political. Um, you know, there, there are lots of people in Israel who, who know this story. Uh, they have read the book. In fact, uh, there's a magazine, in, in uh, a monthly magazine in, in Israel that has published parts of this book. Uh, on a monthly basis. It's, it's very well received in Israel, as I understand it, right? You've been invited on more than one occasion to, to discuss yes, your work. Yes, there. yeah. yeah. Uh, but for political reasons, uh, you know, there, there are political officials, uh, politicians, uh, who find it to their advantage to have bad relations between Iran and Israel, <laughs> you know? Uh, so, you know, there, there are lots of Israelis and Jewish leaders in the United States and England and France, who would like Sadari to receive official recognition. But um, so far, Yad Vashem has not come through. Well, there's an article I read from a couple of years ago in the Israeli newspaper Haaretz, uh, mm -hmm. and the story was that Sardari had not been honored by uh, Yad Vashem's Righteous Among the Nations because the museum said it didn't have enough evidence. So how, how much do you think, as you say, political, how much do you think right-wing politicians such as Prime Minister Netanyahu have a, a bearing on Ambassador Sardari's post, posthumous recognition? Well, uh, I, I have my sus suspicion. I don't have the, uh, I don't have the facts, but uh, um, there are things that I can tell you. Uh, one is that copies, photocopies of all the documents I found at the National Archives which are copies of, of the German documents, uh, I send those to Yad Vashem. Uh, in fact, they were hand-delivered to Yad Vashem. Uh, when I wrote my book, I took a copy of my book, and I went to Yad Vashem in person, and I gave it to them. At one point, the head of Yad Vashem asked me for an affidavit uh, from uh, uh, Ambassador Hoveida, Feridun Hoveida, about the things that he had testified. Uh, and... Uh, I went to Hoveida and I got that official uh, and we stamped it and did all the official things to, and I sent it to, to Yad Vashem. After a while, I got a letter that we have not received it. So I did this again for a second time, with, you know, special mail and so on. I, I think each time it cost me over $29 or so to do, do, to do this. So the idea that they don't have the documents is, is something that I have a hard time accepting. Somebody who is actually a, a friend of mine that I was telling about oh. this, uh, who said that he had heard somewhere that that uh, Sardari's name will be added to Yad Vashem this year. Do you know anything about that? Uh, I don't, but I know that uh, there, there was a uh, uh, ceremony in New York not long ago, and one of the people there was actually Sardari's neighbor who bought Sardari's condo he was in New York, and he actually initiated a second sort of attempt to have this man recognized. The former head of Yad Vashem at the time was in, uh, was in uh, New York, and uh, he uh, tried to uh, lend a helping hand, you know. What are the reactions that have meant the most to you 
um, especially when you talk about going to Israel and hearing from Israelis uh, of Iranian descent, let's say, or not of Iranian descent, or people in the Iranian diaspora. What have you really treasured in terms of the way people have reacted to this story and your book? Well, uh, uh, the Iranians in general are, uh, feel very proud of this. Uh, you know, it, it gives a feeling of uh, have an uplifting, inspirational sort of feeling uh, that our culture is, is a culture of tolerance. We're, we're nice people, we're good people. <laughs> uh, unlike what you hear in the media about Iran at the moment, and Iranians. Uh, in Israel, Iranians who are in, in Israel, <laughs> <laughs> who migrated to Israel, uh, they, of course, love the story, and uh, they feel very uh, moved by it. Uh, so it, it's been positive all around. Now, uh, having said that, there are a few people who said, oh, well, uh, he, he did this for money. All the evidence shows that this was not the case. You know, the survivors, for instance, uh, clearly say that this was not the case. Uh, in fact, in fact, Sadari, um use his own private means during the time he was in, in France to continue helping his friends uh, until the end of the war, because his salary uh, had been cut after Iran declared war on Germany. Has anyone approached you about um, making a film of this story? Yes. Uh, several people have done that. None of them have succeeded so far. Two other people are still involved. The major issue has been raising enough enough money to uh, to do the project. Right. Documentaries have been made, but uh, a big screen movie. Would you want a big uh, screen movie version of this book? Uh, I would love to see it. Yeah, and I would love people to see it. You mm. know, it it would be wonderful if that would happen. You know, before I, I let you go, it is, I'm very grateful to get to talk to you about this book. It quite moved me. Let me ask you a little bit about your story, because it's no less interesting to a certain extent. You, you were born in the 1940s in Iran. You came west first before the revolution and studied uh, in America. You then returned to Iran, and your second and final departure from Iran was much more stressful and coincided with the storming of the U.S. Embassy in, in Tehran and around the revolution. How did you manage to leave in the post-revolutionary havoc? Tell me about that time. Well, uh, uh, I came to the United States as soon as I graduated from high school, you know, Albus High School. Uh, and I studied in the United States uh, after I got my master's degree in international relations, and political science and international relations. Uh, I returned to Iran. It was uh, uh, early 1970. And of course, I had studied. I had no intention of staying in the United States. I had come to study and go back. I went back to Iran. I was attending a wedding, actually. And I found myself standing next to Dr. Meswaza, the publisher of Kehan. And just to making small talk, I, I said I was the editor of a campus newspaper when I was studying in the United States. He said, oh, in that case, you have to come and, come and work for me. So I, I went to Kehan, I started working for Kehan uh, as a journalist. Well, uh, after the revolution, uh, I, I think nine months after the revolution, I left Iran. At that time, I, I was also the deputy executive director of the Iran British Chamber of Commerce. There was a meeting in London, uh, and I could attend that meeting. So I I left with uh, a very small briefcase with a change of clothes and $4,000. That was the limit you could take with you. Hmm. Uh, so I left for London. And from London, I, I went to the United States um, because a professor of mine uh, had offered me a fellowship. Uh, my wife is from Thailand. We met in college in the United States. Uh, our eldest son was born in the United States. My wife, of course, being Thailand, she had an Iranian passport and a, and a Thai passport. My son had an American passport, the elder son. My younger son was only two years old, was born in Tehran. So they went to Thailand in order to join me in, in the United States from there. But by that time, hostages had been taken and uh, President Carter had issued an executive order not to give visas to Iranians. So my two-year-old, son in diapers was a persona non grata, couldn't get a visa right. to come to the United States. Right. 
So I went to the office of Senator Biden, Senator from Delaware, who had graduated from the same university. And same, same guy who might be president of the United States now, yes, Joe Biden. Yes, yeah. the same <laughs> Joe Biden. I went to his office in Wilmington, Delaware, and I told the story to, to the lady who was in his office. Right. Uh, a couple of days later, I got a telephone call from my, my wife from Bangkok, Thailand. And she said, we just got a telephone call from the embassy, U.S. embassy. And the person said, Madam, we don't know what kind of influence you have in Washington, but your son's visa is ready. Wow. <laughs> so are you saying that you're, you've ended up back in the United States with, your, with a, a pretty successful career over the last 40 years due to Joe Biden? <laughs> and, and if so, are you working on his campaign <laughs> because you owe him? <laughs> I'm not working on his campaign, but I'm, uh, I am very much thankful to him. <laughs> yes. You know, I mean, this is a sidebar. I mean, we've gone astray here a little bit, but do you see any parallels between the ordeal that you had to go through back then and the plight of Iranians who are prevented from visiting their loved ones or continuing their education in the U.S. today as a result of the Muslim ban? Well, of course, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, we have, we have that Persian expression, Gurakar uh, Darbalh or Hungary. Somebody did, did something in a city, a, a, a uh, blacksmith did something in, in a city, they uh, uh, executed a, a, a copper worker in another city. Right, right, you know, right. this one has nothing to do with the other. But uh, I guess it makes some people feel uh, they have accomplished something. Let me ask you one final yeah. question. Um, sure. We often discuss on this program what the ingredient is, what the elixir or magic potion that keeps so many of us, even those of us who did not grow up in Iran, like me, mm -hmm. so connected to our Iranian descent, especially in the face of a regime in Iran for the last four decades that we would not think representative of many of us. In the prologue to your book, Professor Bokhtari, mm -hmm. you say something revelatory, which is the following. You say, Iran has fallen upon hard times more than once, but has managed to rise up time and again. What has assured the nation's survival has been its profound cultural consciousness. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by that? You know, there, there really is a profound understanding that there is a difference between right and wrong, what is appropriate, what is not appropriate, uh, between beauty and ugliness. Uh, you see manifestations of this everywhere. If you really look, uh, look, look, at, look at Persian art, there really is something that not only recognizes what is right, what is wrong, what is nice, what is not nice, what is beautiful, what is not, but there is also something embedded in this, which is optimism. You know, there is optimism that you create beauty, you make something that is better, you create perfection. You, you would never get there. You might never reach perfection, but you try. Uh, so this is part of the culture. Uh, look at the Persian poetry. I mean, there, there are so many poems about tolerance, about humanity. What you're saying is so beautiful um, mm -hmm. that I hate to uh, pour any cold water on it. <laughs> but, <laughs> but optimism in our community in the contemporary sense um, mm -hmm. sometimes feels like a stretch. It feels like the opposite. It feels like we we feel like the bad Bacht people. We feel like there's so much to be sad about, so much to be upset about, so much to mourn. Um, and so it's an interesting twist to say that we see the beauty in everything or that, that we, we can be optimistic. Well, uh, again, if you look at the, uh, let's say, not only po uh, poetry, but music and the songs, there's also that sadness, but redemption. You know, uh, that that uh, magical bird will rise again out of fire. <laughs> you know? uh, there, there is that optimism. Are you optimistic about the future of Iranians, if not Iran? Most definitely, yes. Uh, the best way to put it is we have had a pendulum effect. You know, the pendulum went from one side to the other side. Now it's going to go back. And eventually we're going to have that equilibrium as all pendulums finally reach. You know? Professor Mukhtari, I can't tell you how much of a pleasure it's been. And the opportunity to speak to you is something I, I very much appreciate. And your time and your patience, thank you for this today. 
Well, thank you. This was delightful. I appreciate it. Hope to see you soon. Okay. Bye bye. 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 That is Professor Fadi Bors Mukhtari. He is the author of the book In the Lion's Shadow, the Iranian Shadow. What based on the story of Abdul Hussein Sardari. So, uh, full circle there. I love that guy. This uh, Gorbani's voice is uh, yes. magical. I'm back. Uh, we, well, you guys are back. I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> Groovy Shia, the fabulous Keon, and uh, Captain Reza. Faiborz um, Mukhtari. Uh, I mean, I, some people know the Sardari story, but mm. uh, and having read the book, it's still uh, it's it's such a remarkable story, and and I'm left uh, uh, in the end of that interview. Even though even though Mukhtari had such inspiring words at the end, I'm, it's 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 a really sad tale. What happens to Sardari by the end? Uh, this guy who, uh, uh, as uh, Faiborz Mukhtari was saying there, he he. Um, consistently says, I, I didn't do anything. I, I just did my job. You know, doesn't want or feel he requires hero worship. Gion? To be that modest and humble after all that he did is so rare and almost unheard of. Um, I think at one point he was saying how uh, Sardari responded to his uh, his nephew, uh, Hoveda. He says, I simply perform my duty. It was my duty to help my fellow Iranians, to which his nephew re responded. But some of these people were not even Iranian. They were French. And right. he said, and that was my duty to God. That, yeah. That's how how humble of a person to say yeah. something like yeah. that. So, uh, Shia, what did you... Uh, <laughs> Uh, I'm speechless. Okay, I I thank cannot, you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, really, <laughs> really. We can move on. Yeah, yeah, you, you, yeah, you, you were moved by it. Yeah, and also uh, I have to thank to Mr. Mukhtari, you know, because uh, it's our duty to keep this story alive, mm. and mm. Uh, he did a great job. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. That's well said. Well said. Well yeah, said. Captain Reza. I want to read the book now. I I had I, I didn't I haven't read the book. I didn't know about it, but I guess this is you see this is another uh, amazing um, um, thing about a program like this where mm -hmm. we introduce stories that are not very mm -hmm. well known or characters uh, in the history. It's 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 amazing, it's Captain Reza. I, I think it would be great if you read this book. Actually, it'd be great no, if no. you read a book. <laughs> <laughs> 1982. I read that one. That's on my list. No, it's uh, the book is definitely worth uh, reading. It's mm. uh, it's it's it's. I was. Uh, uh, I'm glad I had the opportunity to read it to to, to be able to interview uh, Fabius Mokhtari. All right. Did you want to say something else? I just want to say the fact that someone like Schindler is so mainstream, everybody knows his story. The fact that we don't. I had no idea this person existed. Mm. So. Uh, my gratitude to you, Jean, for bringing this subject up. And um, I guess for me, I always I always hear of these pre-regime regime change stories from my parents. So that's the only perspective that I have. So every time you have an older guest on this show, I kind of, I sit down like a little kid, like story time. Mm. I want to hear all about that time. Mm. And he, he spoke about um, how Iran was back in the day. It was so, they were so tolerant, uh, whether you're a different religion, different culture, and how wonderful this place was. It sound, sounded like a utopian world. So I wonder how much of that is true? Because that's what well, my parents uh, say as well. 
they say it's this wonderful. I mean, I, uh, yeah, not everybody yeah. uh, believes it was a utop- utopian place. Uh, right. In fact, when you say pre-regime, there's there was a regime, and then there was a regime before the yes, regime. There was. There was a, yeah, so, so <laughs> there pre- must there, have been some a pre-regime issues. is thousands of years ago. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, no, there are elements of. I mean, there's a there's sort of common themes that we're mm. hearing, like people talking about the diversity of certain parts of, for example, Tehran society in in the 70s or mm-hmm. or 50s or 60s. So yeah, one thing that in the interview it resonated with me was the f- what what the story was talking about when he went to Kerman or Kashan, I forgot um, which city it was, and uh, um, his uh, uncle's neighbor uh, were Jewish. Uh, and it was Saturday, so they couldn't, they're, they're, they're not, reli- but like by their religion, they're not allowed to touch um, electricity or exchange any sort of, do trades and stuff. So he sent their butler to turn on the lights for them and the, the, the stove in the kitchen. I had a very similar story. Our neighbor back in back home in, back in Shiraz uh, were Jewish. Uh, there were, we had a lot of Jewish neighbors, uh, and um, I remember one day there was a knock on our door, and they didn't ring a bell either. Huge knock on the door. Reza, Reza. I came out, and I still remember his name. His name was Igal, uh, and uh, he was like he was yelling. He was like, "Call 911. Call 911 for us, please, and come turn off the the, the fuse, the switch box for the uh, for the electric the electricity box." I'm like, "What's going on?" He's like, "Our house got on fire. This, this is on fire, basically." So we we called 911 for them because they're they weren't like they couldn't do that. Uh, I, when he said that, it reminded me of mm. of that event, mm. and uh, it was it was interesting. It was very fascinating. Actually, what's interesting about that is you're. Uh, you grew up after the revolution. That's right. right? Yeah. So, so what we know that there are still thousands of Jews in Iran, uh, and we expect that it, uh, life is difficult for them. But in some cases, in some neighborhoods, I guess, as you're talking about, yeah. uh, the the coexistence is still there. Exactly, exactly. You can find it here and there. Well, I, what I'm grateful for Mukhtari is is uh, Professor Mukhtari is is through this story and uh, this true story. Uh, sending out this message, I think that's what we're all dancing around, that uh, Iranians aren't just this stereotype of, mm-hmm. uh, uh, well, certainly not the the evil empire stereotype of these uh, crazed terrorists, but even beyond that, that um, that we have these stories in our, um, in our recent history mm. that speak to such tolerance and uh, that are quite beautiful. Um, well, it's Thursday. The team is here. We're going to get to Sepi de Nasri in just a bit. But first, it's time for Letters of the Week. Okay, so this week on episode 36, we had a feature interview with Shahla Itafaq, a.k.a. Mother Miracle. She spoke about leaving her luxurious life in California behind to build a school for children in India and how she has evolved as a person since then. So we have a few people that wrote on that specific episode. We have a Reza Ain on YouTube wrote, Jian slash Rook team. First of all, great interview. The world needs more people like Mother Miracle. Good on you, Shahla. Truly a miracle for making a difference in people's lives. Uh, we have Bahar Ganbari on YouTube also wrote Ganbari. R- Ganbari. There you Thank go. you for that. There you go. Uh, wrote Rook Team. He's back. He's back. <laughs> I was Thank waiting you. for it. I missed that. Uh, Rook Team. I suggest that you have a Rook Media Telegram channel such that Iranians inside Iran can have access to your content more easily. Thanks for the wonderful job you are doing. Captain Reza, weren't we talking about doing a Telegram? Yeah, or? actually, today uh, we were starting our new Telegram channel so people can join. Uh, they can find us on Telegram at uh, Rook Media. Oh, great. All right. Media. All right. However, I thought Telegram was also filtered in Iran and they had to use proxy and stuff, but... Not to take oh, it. I thought Telegram was the way people communicate. You know, right? Yeah. I, I, so anyway, thank uh, you, Bahar Gambari. Good suggestion. We've uh, we've listened to you. Yes. Okay. Uh, on that same episode, we have a Achil. I believe that's how it's pronounced. Achil, Achil, Joshi uh, wrote, "She's amazing. I love you so much, ma'am." Nice. Very nice. And then we. Do have you think that that person means uh, Mother Miracle or you, Keon? I, I don't. Well, I believe well, Mother say, I Miracle so in this much, in this instance. Okay. I mean, I'd like to think it was me, but no. <laughs> uh, moving on, we have a username Nick Farhang A on YouTube wrote Jianjian. 
I have been following Rook since episode one. I have a great appreciation for the excellent job you've been doing on your contemplative, well-balanced, softly but yet firmly probing intelligent line of questioning of your guests. But your interview with this Shahla Khanum, with all her glory, does not resonate with me at all. It seems that you had previously agreed to not ask her certain questions in exchange for her participation in the interview, and you seem to have acquiesced. As she attested in her talk, she was raised with a golden spoon in her mouth. You could say that her family are the Rockefellers of Iran. They are so rich and yet so oblivious and blind to all those thousands of beautiful and smart children who are begging to sell a piece of gum to the fancy car drivers on the streets of Iran and sleep in cardboard boxes out of sight in the worst conditions all over the city and millions more all over the country. How could she turn her back to her own there are thousands of Indian families whose maids have more money than Shahla Jun. How many of them have come to Iran and tried to give a helping hand? This Shahla Khanum is still living a life of luxury and she acts as though she is getting verklempt. But I don't buy her false tears. She gives herself the title Mother Miracle. How pompous is that? She personifies the elite society of Iran and that's why we are where we are t today. That was, uh, that was a that's one. a heavy loaded. <laughs> Nick Farhang. <laughs> yeah, Nick Farhang. Well, uh, first of all, just to clarify, I, I I don't make deals with anybody before any interviews. There are no, um, <laughs> I, I would I've never done that in my life, and I don't uh, in any show that I've ever worked. I wouldn't do it now. That just means sometimes people don't come on or don't want to do it because uh, I would never. I don't give people the questions beforehand. I, I never make deals. I'm, I'm going to talk about this. I'm not going to talk about this. I promise not to talk about this. So uh, you can don't worry about that, uh, Nick Farhang. Uh, in terms of uh, Shahla, she was quite open about the fact that she came from privilege. And, you know, if somebody comes from privilege, and I, I mean, I won't debate you on the Iran versus India. Uh, I, I tend to think that there's probably people in need uh, uh, in various countries in the world. I, know, I don't know why we need a hierarchy, but um, she herself said that her dad questioned her on that and said, why aren't you helping the, the kids of Iran? And she said she that the universe guided her to India. So... Um, uh, that's her response. I, I guess the way I feel is if, uh, you know, she may have come from privilege, but if she spent the last 20 years saving lives, helping people, um, and putting all of her resources into building a school that feeds thousands of people, including the staff and the families of these kids, uh, year after year, uh, I think that's very great. I believe, yeah. <laughs> well, she's adding value to this world, and I think that's more than most people can say. So, yeah. respect to her. And if she hadn't done anything, if she was, she came from wealth, mm -hmm. and if she hadn't done any of the stuff that she did, I nobody would have blamed Judged her, her or like attacked her for being a rich, wealthy woman living yeah. her life. Right now, she's giving back, and there is questions about why are you giving back to this particular group of people? Look, it's a fair question. So it a is, lot of people would say, not, why, why, just, why not Iran? You're Iranian, yeah. but uh, but uh, I think she answered that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for yeah. herself anyway. Uh, as well, last week on episode 35, we had an interview with the renowned Iranian-American scientist and leading figure at NASA, Dr. Firuz Nadiri. He discussed the progress on the mission to Mars, the importance of space exploration, as well as his experience with speaking out about politics on social media and dealing with critics as a result. So a few people wrote on that one. Um, My Nikon on YouTube wrote, username My Nikon, Stop looking at these saviors from foreign lands that will never come. That's a quote directly from Dr. Nadiri. And he responds to that saying, Brilliant. This conversation challenged me and shifted my mind about Professor Nadiri. This is exactly why we need these interviews. As well, we have Farhud SM on YouTube wrote, It seemed like Dr. Nadiri had more to share. I wish the interview format was longer. My brother recently introduced me to Rook. I'll have to write a, a letter to, to tell you how much this podcast means to me, Jian. Happy to hear your lovely voice again. Thank you, Farhood. That's nice. That's lovely. You don't have to write a letter. You just did. It's <laughs> perfect. And then we have a very different tone. This is from a user named Garshosp Nodan. He, I believe it's a he. He wrote, Mr. Nadari is a successful scientist, but that's all he is. He is not a prominent soci sociologist, political expert, or historian. 
Why should his political or sociological beliefs matter more than any other person? I personally dislike his simplistic and naive political views about Iran, as well as about the US. Moreover, he sadly thinks that the people who protested to his political views are all uneducated, a small minority, and are simply worthy of being ignored. Also a note to Jian and to your panel. How come Jian almost always only agrees, compliments, and praises every guest's views? Why is there no challenge? The same is true for your panel members' opinions. <laughs> only praises and wows. Every guest is just fascinating and impressive and poetic and all. It is very telling about our Iranian culture of mutual overcomplimenting. <laughs> I mean, listen, all the guests are impressive people. It's hard to go against that. And it just so happens that a lot of our views align with theirs. So I, do you have anything I'm, to say, Jean? <laughs> I'm wondering if I want to, okay, um, yeah, okay, I'll respond to that. I've got three response. Actually, I've got four responses to that. Um, number one, thanks for the feedback. It's fine. It's good. I, I mean, I appreciate any, you guys write in and say anything you want. We and we want to read some of that too to make sure that you're represented. So thanks for that. Two, uh, there is no reason to aggressively challenge some of our guests when we, you know, we've got Leila Ramazan on here to talk about her new album of Iranian piano music. I see no reason to do an ambush interview. Part of my goal is to bring on fascinating and impressive people on Rook. So we don't just book anyone. So why would we book a fascinating person and then attack them and say, you're not fascinating? <laughs> um, three, uh, I don't have a problem with people disagreeing with Peter's Nadiri's views. And honestly, I don't think he does. It's when people condemn him for taking, he was taking umbrage at the, at the the idea that people want to shut him down and that they're not open to discussion. They're just attacking him for having a, a point of view. That's that's the issue. Uh, and in terms of challenging, uh, number four, I would say you're actually wrong. I do challenge. Um, look, my style has never been to attack or debate an interviewee. I, I know that has come into vogue in recent years, especially in the Trump era, but I don't see that as my role. I ask questions, and because of my tone, it might not always sound like they're challenging questions, but I believe they are. And I do my best to do my job, which is to create the conditions where the guest shows us who they are, tells us their story, shares what they believe. And I've always believed this, the audience is smart. And so if you hear Fidus Naderi say something you don't like or something you think is fake or something you, you think is wrong, you don't need me to tell you that. And with that said, sometimes I do agree with the interviewee. And when it comes to our community, I will say so. Uh, uh, and in terms of you guys, I can't control the panel, but we're actually a pretty diverse group and disagree on a lot of things. I think we actually all have different political opinions. Um, but if we like what Fears Nottery says, I don't see an issue uh, where I have to manufacture dissent amongst mm -hmm. the, our group. I mean, uh, with all that said, I do appreciate the feedback. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, absolutely. It does. And gash up, John. I hate everybody. Why would I like <laughs> anyone? No. Including no, me. I'm joking. I'm joking. Gershas was the last king of Pishdadian dynasty so uh, what do, what do what do we learn from that Shaya uh, Pishdadian dynasty is a kind of mythical dynasty in Shahname oh so they actually and didn't exist it it debate on that oh. uh, some yeah, we don't hmm. know and yeah so Gershas is a la is the name of the last king of Pishdadian and are you dynasty. saying that this is the ca that Gershas <laughs> <laughs> it's a me he's, he's, he's still around. All right, let's keep going. All right, so next. How up. much more do we have? Port we have a few more. Be patient. We We're, gotta we'll get, get. She's to waiting. It. All right. All right. So got an impressive guest can, coming. Can I out. finish? <laughs> cool. Then we have Ali. Should I go faster? I have a Ali Khalili on YouTube wrote another challenging interview. Oh, uh, so <laughs> <laughs> okay. He goes on. So it was a challenging yeah, interview. Yes, yes, it was. Uh, he goes on saying, "I like the brevity and rookness of Gian to sometimes oppose the interview." opinions and shedding light into the discussions. I do believe that frictions slash conflicts and diversity are inevitable ingredients of unity in the Iranian diaspora. We only need more patience to hear the opposite and not always desirable opinions before overreacting on them. And I swear to God, this is a real letter. I did not just recreate that <laughs> based on what Gashasp said. So, huh. Thank you, Ali Khalili. 
And then we have a Afshin Ranbadi Siokali on YouTube wrote, It is always a pleasure to listen to valuable opinions of Firuz Nadiri. All nice. Right. Thank you. And then finally, you thought this time would never come, we have the letter of the week. Oh, this one's very short but sweet. We have a Bahram Nazardad, Nazardad, I believe. Uh, Nazardad. Nazardad. There we go. There we go. Oh, Nothing Nazardad. is more satisfying than Shaya <laughs> correcting you. <laughs> uh, all right, and he ba- quotes Bahram Nazardad. <sighs> I feel like you guys are my parents. <laughs> Bahram Nazar Nazardad. Oh, okay. Uh, he uh, he starts by quoting Dr. Nadiri. At one point, he says, "Young people are the true asset of Iran." He moves on saying, "Excellent point." I would add, in my humble opinion, that our Iranian woman will have a large role to play in the next revolution of Iran. Mm. And that is like absolutely true. I mean, women alone make up 60 to 70 percent of university entrance in recent years in Iran. So the future is in the hands of Iranian women, I believe. There are hope for positive change, and um, I can only hope that it'll come sooner than later. All right. A good choice for letter of the week. Uh, who, who was the winner of the this letter of the week? This was Bahram Nazir. Nazardo. <laughs> 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 All right. Thank you very much, Fabius Keon, Captain Reza, and Groovy Shia. Well, for a very long time, women working in the fields of science, innovation, engineering, and math were doing wonders, but got little, if any, recognition. My next guest today has played a pioneering role in informing the world about the work of prominent women in technology, particularly Iranian women, Middle Eastern women, and women of color. From the age of 16, Sepide Nasiri has had a keen interest in diversity, inclusion, and representation of immigrants, something that has come alongside her success as a tech leader. Sepide is now the CEO and founder of Women of Middle East and North Africa in Technology, an organization that focuses on connecting communities, companies, and individuals to bring change in how we invest in minorities and immigrants. She is now a globally recognized leader for the advancement of women's careers in STEM, and Sepide has provided mentorship for global initiatives such as We Mina, a program by the World Bank, and Tech Women, an initiative of the U.S. Department of State. Currently, Sepide mentors many women entrepreneurs and founders in the fields of technology around the world and serves as an advisor to many early-stage startups. In 2014, Sepide Nasiri was recognized by the San Francisco Business Times Journal as one of the top 40 under 40. She has also received several awards and citations, including from the city of San Francisco, the mayor of Toronto, and the state of California. Right now, Sepide Nasiri joins me from San Francisco today. Hello. Hi, Gian. How are you? Thanks so much for inviting me. I'm very happy to have you on the program, and thank you very much for coming on. Uh, Listen, let's start with the the current moment. Uh, You're sitting there in San Francisco, not too far from Silicon Valley. How do you assess the mood right now in the middle of this pandemic that has been um, unforgiving when it comes to California. What, what is it like in Silicon Valley? How would you characterize the opportunities or losses for women in tech during COVID? Has it changed the mm-hmm. game again? You know, there was a time not too long ago where the tech ecosystem believes that working together in a team setting and in person brings more productivity because you engage more And so it it was more taboo working from home. Now we have been working from home for about five or six months. Productivity is up. We see that everything is working correctly. Nothing has gone down. (laughs) Um, Sites have not crashed. So that gives an opportunity to see that, you know, we are able to manage and work better from home. And it's an opportunity and a possibility. Are they downsizing in Silicon Valley? I mean, I I remember asking. They are. 
Because I, yes. I, I had this conversation with Faye Arjamandi about a month ago when she was on the show, thinking about how the tech sector is not necessarily going to be as affected by a, something like a, a COVID because it doesn't exist. You know, it's it's not retail, it's not restaurants that have to be open. It's actually the place where everybody's running to if they have to work from home or if they're displaced. The online world is always going to exist. So I, I'm surprised to hear that there's layoffs there as well. Absolutely. I mean, it depends on the tech company and what they're offering. So if you look at a company that is uh, providing services now because uh, people are at home, um, and I'll give you an example, it's Uber Eats or Postmates um, and so forth. So they're delivering to you. Obviously, that's going to be higher um, just because the customers are more in need of that. But smaller startups who are starting right now, they're going to trim their team because they had hired maybe more um, than what they needed. And now with uh, not knowing if they're going to be acquiring their customers due to the fact that customers are also being very frugal about their spending since they're not sure if they're going to be keeping their jobs. Um, so when you look at that perspective, then you have to downgrade. I know a bunch of companies that have made lots of layoffs, including Uber, actually. So my answer is it really depends on the company, um, what and their offering and what the customer's needs currently are. I got gotcha. you. I got to you. either keep or not keep. Let me get into your personal story and, and how you emerged as this advocate for women in tech. You are now the CEO of an extremely successful organization with global operations across 17 cities. But in one of the interviews I watched with you from the past, you said, one of my biggest challenges was being an immigrant. Legal mm -hmm. knowledge and the right immigration status can make or break your career path. Sepida, what, what do those words mean to you? When we look at entrepreneurs, 58% of companies that are created in the U.S. right now or even internationally are immigrants. So if you don't have the resources and the opportunities for allowing you to create innovative companies, then, you know, it, it can hinder you. Um, and it can come in as, for me personally, it was a, another company where I was leading the initiatives as a vice president. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to travel at that time due to my status. Uh -huh. And so that hindered the growth of the company drastically. Because um, now I had to outsource for someone else to be present in my place. And it was a challenge. You were born in Iran. You spent yeah. your formative years in Germany. You've lived your adult life in California. Um, <laughs> do you feel like mm -hmm. you have a triple identity between those three places? I recognize myself as a citizen of the world. Um, <laughs> <All right. laughs> Just because, you know, having lived in different places and raised in different mentalities, and I think that at some point that is everyone, right? We are all immigrating across a lot of different continents and borders and so forth. So for me, I feel home where I have my family, my friends and so forth. I don't have a tie to a location. I would say I have more of a tie to my connections. But, you know, that's interesting because you clearly have some thoughts around your self-identity. I mean, you did grow up in the West, but and you so you could have made it your mission to see yourself as somehow Western, but you, mm -hmm. you self-identify as a woman from the Middle East and, in fact, as a woman of color. Um, yeah. How much of that is your choice and how much did you have no choice but to see yourself that way in Silicon Valley? <laughs> As an individual and as a business person, obviously I don't see myself as a woman or, or a woman of color when I go into a meeting. I do see myself as someone who is bringing something to the table to negotiate or pitch. But that doesn't mean that there aren't restrictions out there for women and, and for women of color. And, and I'll give you an example of that is in the media, 17 to 30% of the time, uh, only a woman is interviewed, quoted, or highlighted. Um, so 70% of the time we see men. 
That's the representation out there. So out of that 17 to 30 percent, how much of that percentage will be a woman of color, a Middle Eastern woman or an Iranian woman? And so you trickle down to almost zero. Um, so for me, when I went into a room at a conference and I only saw four women and I was the only Middle Eastern you you do have a feeling that you're outnumbered. It's interesting. You know, we had um, Banafshe Akhlaghi on the program about uh, three weeks ago, four weeks ago. She's fantastic. She's a pioneering human rights attorney and has worked in, the, in all kinds of fields around that. Uh, and she self-identifies as a woman of color. In fact, she made the case, um, I think, in a very important way that Iranians should see themselves uh, as the minority group that we are. And, and for her, that was saying that we are people of color. Even after having her on the program for an hour, where this incredibly brilliant woman is laying out the reasons why she self-identifies that way, we got a bunch of letters and people saying from the Iranian community, you know, saying, in Chibu, Chera, why do we have to call ourselves people of color? We're white, we're Aryan. This, you know, it wasn't entirely a surprise, of course. I wonder if you've had some pushback that way. Why are you calling us people of color? Why are you separating us? We are, we are white. Did you have you have you ever had that? We do check on, and it's really depending on how you look at it, right? Yes, um, we can consider ourselves Aryan, but at the end of the day, you know, we look differently and we have a different culture. And I consider that we are of minority and we are on color, absolutely. And I think if if we don't have that voice and if we don't have that in our corner, we are not going to receive the benefits that we can have, essentially, at the end of the day. So it really depends on how you look at it. If you want to look at it correctly, yes, we are considered minority and we are considered women of color. And she would say the pe- the benefits are, not, not, to, not that I can really speak the way, uh, the, with the eloquence of Ben Afshir, but she would say the benefits are seeing ourselves as part of a broader community. Exactly what you've did, done with Mina, where uh, Iranian women are not just this solitary, you know, uh, a monolith, but are part of a broader community of, of Middle Eastern people or Middle Eastern women or, or women of color would that be correct that is correct you know um when we started the organization um it was focused on one area which was the iranian women but we came to realize that um that entire region didn't have the support system the resources and they would come to us or to our programs so it was just a natural next step in expanding our reach so that we are able to support a larger community. Migration is hard, especially as a kid. I I remember migrating as a Persian kid from the UK to Canada at eight years old, and I I didn't want to leave England, mostly because I was scared of what a new place might look like. I didn't know what (laughs) Canada was. Your family did this twice. So when your family made that second step of migration from Germany to the United States, how did you deal with it? One of the credits I have to give to my dad, my dad um, as an individual has always supported his children in a sense of raising us as individuals. So my dad actually sat me down because I'm the oldest child and asked me if, if it was okay to move and gave me at the age of 14 and a half reasoning wow. of why we are moving. It's super interesting to see that. I will never forget it. So having had the information on why we are leaving and uh, the reasoning behind it and the benefits behind it made me not only more aware, but there was no upsetness about it. And so there was a goal and a purpose. So coming to the United States, I knew the purpose and I knew the goal behind it. And and of course, every Iranian gets that, right? You, you have to do the schooling, become good students so you can... Um, have a better life. And is, better is that what it was? I mean, surely you had friends and and a community in Germany. So, so how did your dad yeah. sell this to you? <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, one of the things why we moved is the Berlin Wall had come down, and unfortunately, due to that, there was a lot of racism happening in Germany. Um, there was a lot of threat towards foreigners. Of course, as you pointed out earlier, you know. 
uh, Persians who are considered Aryans who are not uh, in that pool. But when they look at you, they don't know if you are Persian right. or Turkish right. or Italian. Um, and so those two other communities were actually the ones that were targeted. And for the first time in my school, I went to gymnasium and uh, I received a B plus and that had never happened before. And my dad, of course, goes to talk to my teacher and there was no explanation. So he kind of realized that the effects are coming. Um, and so for him, it was really important to move us. Meaning you think you got a, a, a worse grade because uh, uh, because of that kind of prejudice that was happening? In yes, the- absolutely. Wow. That's mm-hmm. tough. That's really tough, especially as circumstances change. So um, that makes sense in terms of shaping who you then are going to become. Do you then consider your time in Germany, does it somehow sully your time in Germany? Do you have difficult mixed feelings about that then? Not at all. I mean, um, everything for me uh, and my experience were great. I didn't even realize, you know, my father wasn't like very particular about mentioning those things to me at that time. But uh, for me, it was, I did see the change within my friends who were, you know, Turkish or Italian and and the conversations around that. But I personally didn't feel the effects immediately. So for me, I still have an amazing feeling towards Germany where I have family and I had friends and, you know, experiences of cultures that were there that I truly still miss today and the food, of course, as well. So no, you, you don't um, the food give up. Yes, German we, food, absolutely. Oh, come on, <laughs> I mean Berlin is my one of my favorite places in the whole world. Really, it's an incredible city. But the, I don't know about the food. I, <laughs> oh, Germany is amazing, and there is something called the carnival uh, where people dress up, and sure. uh, it's like similar to Halloween, and and then you go and eat amazing food. Yes, I loved it. So set the scene for me at the time when you're a 15 year old arriving in Silicon Valley as a new immigrant. What do you remember of that time? I was shocked that there was such a diverse community. I had never seen, I don't know what they call it here, um, a salad bowl of mix of different types of looking of people. Mm. Um, In Germany, I didn't have that. So that was definitely the first shock uh, to see such a diverse community. Obviously, language barrier again. I did speak British English, but for me, or maybe it's I was I'm just a chameleon. I can you know adapt to new environment. I'd done it before. I was more worried because coming in, you know, I was going into high school that I would be behind. Those were my worried. But I was you know for me, my dad set up an image of this is going to be better. So I was super looking forward to conquer (laughs) this new land, basically, if you can say that. All right. So you're a Persian girl who's partly grown up in Germany. You're a teenager now in California. Tell me about working at Victoria's Secret and The Gap. Oh um, God! <laughs> not not exactly Oracle and Intel, but but I'm not sure you I'm sure you learned some lessons in retail. What 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 did you learn from doing that? You think? Yes, I you know I learned the sky's the limit. You can be whoever you want to be, and you can do it anything what you want to do at any age. And the reason for that was that you know I worked only six months at the Victoria's Secret at the Bath and Body section before I was poached by uh, Gap, the general manager of Gap. And um, to just run an entire department, she loved my engagement with her so much and the information and the enthusiasm I had for working where you I You were headhunted by the Gap at the, at the age 17? Yes. Uh-huh. That's, that's, that's pretty impressive. You've outdone yourself. <laughs> Yes, and um, I, I, I'd become an assistant manager at that point at Victoria's Secrets Bath and Body. But, um, you know, I, I believe in whatever you're doing, it doesn't matter what you're doing. You have to give you 100% and you have to be the best that you can be at that position. And so then I was at Gap. Within a couple months, I was recruited from corporate to build out with three other of our managers, the Gap Banana Republic and Bath and Body Employee Handbook. 
So how people are being trained right now at those three companies is the handbook that I created with three other managers. So you were an entrepreneur from the beginning. I mean, even as a yeah. teenager, that the seeds of, of all of this career are in you. You end up studying business and psychology at UCI, and your first job upon graduation was co-founding an on- and offline magazine highlighting successful Iranians like Pierre Omidyar, the uh, founder of eBay. You, you seem to have jumped right into being this entrepreneur. So how did your parents react to that? How was your dad doing yeah. with that? Not very happy. <laughs> I don't think any Iranian parent is happy to have, I mean, it has changed obviously throughout the years. Being an entrepreneur is sexy. Can I say that on the air? Um, but, um, you know, back in the days, my uncle, my parents were all shocked. They're like, can we get you a job? Can we find you a job? We have so many connections. Can we utilize? I said, no, I don't, I don't want to just get a job. I really want to build and be a part of something that's creating impact, that's changing people's lives. And that was really important to me in some ways or another. Is your dear father still around? Oh, he is. And, and, and uh, has he come around? Does he now, um, he, he must be proud of you. Oh, yes. It has certainly shifted <laughs> that opinion. Um, I'll tell you, uh, in 2012, when I started, spoke at Google I.O. It's the largest conference that Google puts together yearly. Um, I was the first female who was non-technical at that conference on, on a panel talking about women in tech. And after my father saw the interview that afterwards happened, he was crying, calling me and said that he's proud of me. Uh -huh. So I think that was, that was the milestone that I created with, you know, he didn't believe in it before, right? Why are you working at startups? Why are you always trying to be not secure? You're always going for these opportunities that there's a potential of failing. And for me, that was okay because I knew I would learn from those lessons and that will push me forward to the next opportunity or experience. So let me get into the focus of, of what you do in your uh, work and in your organization. Um, and, and at this point in your story, I mean, you begin a career in, in the tech industry uh, in your early 20s that has now been a successful one for over 16 years. Given the reckoning in Silicon Valley, uh, if not elsewhere in recent years, I mean, it isn't necessarily news or controversial today to state that there has been a diversity issue in the tech industry and especially along gender lines. But that wasn't always at the top of the list of things that companies were willing to address uh, not so long ago. What was the moment that caused a deep shift in your perspective on what diversity means? And when did you first realize Silicon Valley has a diversity problem? While working in tech, I knew that Silicon Valley or the tech companies have a diversity problem because the companies I worked at, um, they're all acquired today. I was the only woman in the executive team or in the room that were important decisions were made. So you did feel it. When someone starts a company, um, usually male, that, that's been most of tech companies that you can see right now in the Fortune 100 or 500 or even in the startup world here in the US or Canada or Europe, you usually hire within your own circle. So depending on which school you went to, which friend circle you have, which classes you took with, you hire those individuals because you trust them. You don't go outside of that. So as the company is growing, you're hiring the same type of people over and over because you're not bringing anyone outside of that circle. Mm -hmm. And until one day you are at 20 employees, you realize they're all men circling around in your office. Right, right. And they're all white men <laughs> from the same university, for example. So not only is that not good because of optics, but it's also not good for perspective of what you're building. Um, and I will give you an example there. If you're building products, let's say, similarly to Apple, which has phones and computers or any accessories, if you don't have someone sitting at your table or right. two people who are women, you would never know that women have smaller hands, for example. 
what you've been talking about so far is structural, is institutional, is systemic in terms of the sexism, the, the underlying racism or, um, or issues around diversity. Uh, I'm just curious, have you um, personally faced overt anti-Iranian or anti-immigrant sentiment in, uh, or, or in, in, Sil- in Silicon Valley? Not personally, not at all. And I don't, I, I, I asked this question, you know, because I knew certain people who, who were harassed or certain people who were the harassers and I've been around them and how is it possible that I didn't experience this? And um, it was very interesting. The answer I received was A, I've always worked in a company that was, you know, empowering women. So, and then as an individual, someone, and I'm quoting only what this person said, they said, no one would dare Seppi that they know you're very loud, you're very expressive. Um, they knew they couldn't get away with that with you. When do you go from recognizing that there's this diversity issue, being the only woman in the, in the room, etc., cetera, um, to saying, I got to do something about this? And to then forming the organization Persian Women in Tech, which then also the women of MENA in technology that you mm-hmm. then found. Uh, what, what's the moment where you go, I've got to get active about this? So I was complaining, as I mentioned, a lot about the lack of women and going to conferences. And so my friends kind of got sick and tired of listening to my complaints and said, Sabita, you've been just sitting here and talking about it. Why don't you do something about it? Here is a person in San Francisco who has this passion project uh, about bringing more women into technology and providing resources. I think you could build upon that with your experience that you have had and support this to become a company. Um, And so that's how it started. It was really serendipity how we met. um, And with that started Women 2.0. And what we did is we built out on that. So we were pioneers in what you see all these women in tech or women in STEM organization today. We were the, one of the first companies that focused on that, elevating the profile of women in tech. And so we showcased how when you provide resources and able and support women, they thrive. So 10 years in now, that organization supported the unicorns you see today having gone public, like Stitch Fix, Rent the Runway, Eventbrite, all of those female founders were in our community back in the day. And also showcase to companies that these women are to be reckoned with. They are incredible trailblazers and they have innovative ideas and they're changing the face of tech. So after that, after I left the company, I was burned out. Um, I was taking a lot of different types of uh, roles um, due to different internal things that were happening. I started early, uh, well, I was starting to advise more early stage startups and focusing more on the women. And an Iranian woman who is a dear friend of mine asked me, since I was her advisor, to introduce her to a um, Iranian woman engineer, so she could diversify her engineering team since as a female founder, she didn't hire any women engineers. Hmm. So you would think my network is pretty large, so it should be a piece of cake finding her, an Iranian woman engineer, but I had not one person in mind or in my network. Wow. It was very small. I just created a meetup, brought wine and cheese. Seven Iranian women showed up who work in tech. And after an hour of conversation talking about challenges and where we work, they asked again to meet. So we met again another month, next month. Um, 20 Iranian women in tech showed up. So I said, ah, okay, so they exist. They are somewhere. (laughs) Um, And mind you, I did this because I couldn't find even a community within these larger companies to tap into. That's why I had to create my own meetup. Right. I had called at Google, my friends who were non-Iranian or Apple or Facebook and so forth. And at that time, and this is in 2015, they didn't have anything. Um, they did have for other ethnic groups like Indians and African American and Latinas and so forth. But our community was certainly missing. It's, it's and interesting. And that was very confusing. It's somewhat analogous to the... Uh 
the lack of casting of Iranians to play Iranians in, <laughs> in a lot of Western TV and movies, yes. where the where the director or the producer will say, "Well, we couldn't find it. There there aren't any Iranian Iranian actors," and you kind of go, "Um, no, there are. <laughs> you just you just haven't you know made an effort to find them. Uh, so yeah. you you cast a, a Latin person or somebody uh, to play us. Give us a snapshot of." where you feel things are are at now if you can do that i mean because you have you are privy to these boardrooms of these of what have become the biggest companies in the world these large tech companies like google and facebook who are beginning to be held accountable for their diversity their race mm -hmm. their sex uh, gender issues uh, you've also advised early stage startups and you were a consultant to companies like uh, Deloitte and HP and Twitter and and Google on issues of diversity do you think the discriminatory hiring or promotion practices of big companies are changing not enough even though now it's been what? six years almost, um, that these diversity, and if you look at 10 years, um, the needle has not moved, really. Um, and we still have a lot of work to do. And, you know, it comes back to, we personally have biases as individuals. Um, the hiring process has not changed in so many years. We are not innovating the way we hire people. I think, you know, there are products and services out there where you can blind choose quote unquote your hire by looking at the resume instead of looking at the name or and, and thinking whether it's female or male or if it's what ethnicity it is because all of us as humans we do have biases because of our experiences we have had in the past maybe as a child someone did something to us so <laughs> as our friend or stole our little ball or something and so now Internally, we have kept that, right? And so that comes out in, in our role wherever we are working. So as hiring processes have not changed, we are not aware of our biases, nothing can move um, forward. And that's one of the things, you know, I address a lot at these tech companies. And when I'm advising is, A, you need to make your employees responsible and casting the net much wider connecting and um, building upon relationship with organizations like Women of Mena in Technology or Women uh, Who Code or Girls Who Code or Black Girls Who Code, so to diversify your talent pool. Also, investing in these communities is really important, not just as companies, but also as a community. I think that's how we are going to be making these changes. And it also starts at home. Parents have to encourage their children, whether boy or girl, to think about technology and their career path and what they should learn or what they should know or encourage them to know. Do you have any data on that, by the way, that, um, uh, I mean, not just between boys and girls, but whether, uh, say, Iranian girls in the diaspora are less inclined to go into tech than other girls? Uh, do, you, do, you, do you have any stats on that? You know, I have certain stats, like one of the interesting things is, and if you look at the Iranian diaspora, 70%, this is according to Forbes in 2018, I believe, or 2019, there was an article that came out that 70% of university graduates out of Iran are women who are studying STEM, so engineering, math, sciences. Uh, in the U.S., it's less than 30%. Interesting. The talent pool is there. They're just not, it, now we got to get them in the boardrooms. Yes. Sepita, your organization, uh, Women of Mina and Tech, I, I read that it's mainly self funded. Yes, what, what yours is truly. <laughs> what, is that? what do you mean? You mean you've, you've funded this? Yes, my own pocket. Um, 90%. Yeah, 90, 99, 98. But isn't this your main, yeah. your, this is your career? Right. It is. So, um, so how can you? <laughs> why? Why are you doing that? I mean, that's a, that's a, it's very inspirational. But um, you deserve to. Don't you deserve to be compensated? Why not develop an infrastructure where you're you are being compensated for this work? No. Yes, absolutely, and you know that is something that we're focusing on getting to. There is some challenges. A, we are a nonprofit organization. I wanted to set it up as one. I could have 
easily set it up as a for-profit and possibly been acquired by now. Um, as I mentioned, the last company, and we built out on these similar structures, uh, was right. acquired within four or five years. So, And the irony is when people say they're looking for funding, it's usually Silicon Valley that they're trying to, to <laughs> go to. You, you, you already have the, you got, you got the speed dial there. So you yes. could, yeah. So why a it's non-profit a then? Um, non-profit because I really wanted what we are creating to stay. I didn't want the mission to change. I didn't want the focus to change. When your company gets acquired, sometimes it's acquired and then it's lost. So I didn't want that for this. I really thought, and I'm still believing that this mission is such an important mission, especially for the community we are serving. Yes. So obviously because it was new, I wanted to also showcase that it's needed. It has created impact. Um, and. I didn't want to have too many voices diverting the direction that I knew it was possible since I've done this before. Um, so that was first part. Um, the second part, um, as a nonprofit, we operate like a startup. Um, as you might know, nonprofits die within five years if they're not structured correctly, if they're not run correctly. And so that was the other part, you know, we are reinventing the way nonprofits are working and it's working. I mean, everyone is so surprised that within five years with barely any funding from outside, we're in 17 cities, we have served over 2000 community members worldwide. We have highlighted over 3000 Iranian women who are doing incredible things in tech. But it can be nonprofit and still uh, not have to be funded by you, right? It, yes, it does. It's hard to get funding for something like this. Well, what about the Persian community? community? How's that been? Have you? <laughs> no? Um, not as much. I'm pretty disappointed um, about it. Uh, you know, um, the most uh, common answer I got when we talked about funding from high profile, who are millionaires and beyond, and, um, you know, high net worth individual was they already are. Um, funding something. And most of our community that we talked to had, um, uh, they had more of an interest in investing into art and culture role organization than the future of their girls, women, um, and technology and education. I, I mean, based on the guests we've had on this show, they're not investing in the arts and culture institutions either. <laughs> they might be telling you um, that, but uh, we, uh, you know. So, but I have to say, you know, we had incredible support system from individuals. Uh -huh. You know, I'll tell you uh, one person that I'm so thankful um, of who did give us financial support for a bit is Bobby Azdani from Coda Capital. And, uh, you know, not only did he give financial support, he also gave um, advice on the structure of our company and where we should go and so he was a soundboard um, for us as well. But beyond that, you know, our community is the Iranian women, for example, they volunteered their time. Our website is purely built on volunteers. I don't know if you had the chance to look at it. I did. I'm really proud of what they have achieved. Our 17 cities around the world is purely volunteers. So we have over 100 volunteers who I manage. But from a financial standpoint, I'm pretty disappointed in our community that they did not support this. We received a lot of advice, I call it, quote unquote. Why do you have Persian in your name? You know, uh, companies will not work with you. You want to hear so. something funny? We, uh, our tagline for Rook is conversations from, to, and about the Iranian diaspora. The only uh, people who've had issue with that on, on our behalf supposedly are Iranians who say, Jianjian, you should take the Iranian out of the name though, because that'll <laughs> that'll be better. <laughs> it's like, but but the focus of the show is Iranian. <laughs> no, no, no. But if you don't say Iranian, it'll be and it's just such a uh this circle of um uh, uh of inferiority complex laced inside our superiority complex that is uh complex you know it's very uh, interesting yeah. because you 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 know you mentioned earlier how our our california senator recognized the work that we were doing at persian moment you know we were on their map they were looking at us or 
the San Francisco mayor or, uh, you know, John Tory from Toronto, the Toronto mayor. So um, it's very interesting that, you know, outside of our community, we do get a lot of support and support system. But I don't know why the financial support is not coming. I'm grateful for the time that you've uh, given us today, and I'm grateful for what you're doing for for our community and for women in tech. Before I let you go, you know, I've read, I don't know if I read it somewhere or heard you say somewhere that, uh-uh. that, when, <laughs> that when, you, <laughs> when you were a kid or from an early age, you've always wanted to make a, a difference in the world. And I, I wonder where you're at with that. What's driving you at this stage? I mean, it, it occurs to me that you could very easily be spending 24-7 uh, on some lucrative startups that, uh, since you know the game, you know how to do it, you could be spending your focus on getting rich and instead you're donating your time and now we find out you're actually funding yourself this this initiative uh, for the last few years that is dear to your heart, that is all about giving back. Uh, talk to me about that before we let you go. Sure. Thank you so much, Jan, by the way. This has been such an incredible conversation. Um, I really appreciate you highlighting people like us so that our voices are heard and our stories are heard. So it's such an important, important mission you have taken upon yourself. Um, you know, nothing has changed. And you're right, pinpointing. I do get poached a lot by bigger tech companies um, all the time. And um, for me, nothing has changed in regards to impact. Um, I want to leave behind when I leave here, this world, um, that I've done something that has made changes for humanity. You know, one point I guess I want to leave behind for your listeners is think that you can have so many excuses in this world of why you can't do something or why you can't support something or why you shouldn't do something. But I want them to find all the reasons why they have to do it. And for me, in everything that I've done or the work that I'm currently doing, it's not about not doing or I could do something else. It's why I have to do this. And so that's what drives me every day because I know the goal and the mission behind it of why I have to do it. Sefi Danasiri, I thank you so much. Thank you so much for your time, Gian. It's been awesome. I, I look forward to speaking to you again. And I, again, I thank you for the work you do. My pleasure. Have a wonderful day. Chodafes. Sepi Denasiri is the CEO and founder of Women of Middle East and North African Technology.